Japan through the looking glass. My broader question, the one that I pursued through much of my life, is what is the nature of the modern world and how did it emerge? And in particular, how did the scientific and industrial revolutions occur, when they occurred and why they occurred where they did? In pursuit of this question, I've worked in England and in Europe, then in the Himalayas and India, then in Japan and now in India, and I've made many visits to each of these places. A particular puzzle I want to look at tonight is why and how Japan was so successful in its industrialization and economy in the period 1880 to 1930. When Europeans arrived in force in the 1850s, it started, that is Japan, by looking very backward, very low technology. For example, it's given up the gun, the hardly any animals, hardly any wheels, no use of glass and so on. It was almost solely based on human labor. Both the housing stock, uh, which was very simple and cheap, and the wages were very low. It seemed to be a pretty backward economy and there was no real scientific knowledge. It was also hierarchical and stratified with a lot of uh, differences between people. And yet, that's 1850-60, yet within two generations it had become a powerful industrial nation capable of defeating both China and then Russia in wars. By 100 years it was the earliest East Asian industrializer, the only country outside Europe and America which by the middle of the 20th century was an industrial nation. Then to prove that this was not just a chance fluke, after the destruction of the Second World War, when much of the stock of Japan, that is its infrastructure, was destroyed, it pulled itself up again and in effect, in one generation between 1955 and 1985, it turned itself into the second largest economy on earth and in many ways the most efficient that there is. It was a massive growth which again preceded and then influenced the Four Little Tigers and Korea. How can we explain this extraordinary, almost miraculous growth in just one small island? Now, of course, after the rise of China and India and Korea and one or two other places, it doesn't seem quite so extraordinary as it did a few years ago, but it is still enormously significant. Let's first of all eliminate impossible reasons, as uh, Sherlock Holmes would have done. And eliminate the impossible and then you're left with possibilities. What's special about Japan? So let's see some possible causes. Natural resources? Well, not really. Silver had run out. It had been a great product in the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries. Coal was rather poor quality and was used rather late. And uh, it had water, of course, but this was hardly harnessed for power. So not really natural resources. Location? Well, not really. Rather on the edge of things and not a natural entrepreneur, entrepreneur between anywhere, rather on the periphery. Geography? Well, the soil was very poor indeed, very rocky, thin volcanic ash soil, and hardly any inhabitable space. Population? Well, it was not particularly large, though it's true that there were had been a lull in the Tokugawa period which had allowed perhaps wealth to increase while the population remained more or less static for a, a century and a half, as in England. They were, of course, very hard working, but hard work in itself is not enough. Uh, the Chinese, the Koreans, the Vietnamese, many, many 
East Asian peoples that work extremely hard at nice cultivation, and this doesn't lead them to become great, a great industrial nation. Uh, financial acumen, not really outstanding. Fukuzawa Yukichi, the great Japanese philosopher, for example, said that the Chinese were much better with money in accountancy and petty trading and so on than the Japanese. Um, the supposed Confucian culture, as it was a popular candidate in the 1980s, which is sometimes used to explain East Asian development. Firstly, uh, this can't really be it because it, uh, it's not alone in having a sort of Confucian influence culture. Uh, and indeed, of course, the place where it came from, China, had much more so, and as did Korea. Secondly, most people believe that Confucianism was very much altered when it went into Japan, and it's better to talk of Neo-Confucianism, and how this could have affected anything is difficult to see. The political system, it was not really uh, centrally uh, absolutist, not directed in the way that later people explained some of the advances in places like China with an iron control from the center. It's true that the Meiji government and later the bureaucracy after 1945 helped a good deal, but it's very far from the Soviet, the Korean, or even the communist centrally planned model. Power was much more widely distributed up and down the system. There are other factors which are clearly important. They don't explain it, but they are contributory factors. One is in the field of art and design. The Japanese were very good at crafts. And they are a very visual culture. They make beautiful objects extremely well. Their amazing design abilities and practical inventiveness are world famous. They made very early on wonderful toys, they miniaturized things, they used everything minimally and with the least effort, making the most out of the least. And this can be found in many famous Japanese manufacturers, games, manga, and so on, which entranced the world and later led into the world of great firms like Sony. A second contributory factor is the set of special features connected to the social system, a peculiar family society, um, which is much more flexible than the Korean or Chinese one in the sense that adoption of non related, non-kin, is widespread, so you can adopt talented non-kin servants and so on. Also, it's a very mm. open social structure. Um, there's an absence of anything approaching caste. There are um, subgroups who traditionally were discriminated against, particularly the ethnic, remaining ethnic minorities, particularly the Ainu in the north, uh, and the Burakamin, Buraku, a sort of invisible subcaste, and also um, the Koreans who had settled in Japan. But on the whole, it's a very fluid, open, open to achievement and merit kind of society and has been for a very long time. It's a relational society, that is, that everything is interpersonal. It's um, a vertical society, as Gina Kani puts it, and that is that it's a kind of pyramid, but the relations between people are negotiable and fluid. It mixes status, there are differences, but also they're based on contractual ties between people. For example, it turns business firms into a kind of family system, and family systems into a kind of business. It mixes business and family in a strange way. Um, 
people work extremely well together. There's great loyalty and dedication to the task in hand. And all this was essential and a very good background to the enormously rapid shift from an agricultural to an industrial society. It's famously known as a NATO or bean curd society, which is a metaphor where the fermented bean curd, which puts out little tendrils, all the little tendrils mixed together. And Japan is somewhat like that. Another background feature is the strongly integrated political system. Adam Smith once in an early lecture said that all you needed for the development of opul op opulence were peace, easy taxes, that's reasonable, just, fair taxes, and a due administration of justice. And Japan has had all three for a long time. In terms of peace, the extraordinary inner peace that had existed for 250 years under the Tokugawa, then under the Meiji, lasted from the early 17th century right through until 19, the 1930s and the wars then. There were external wars, but like England, the advantages of peace were there, and for similar reasons. They were islands, and therefore not invaded, and both of them, on the whole, avoided serious civil wars. In terms of easy taxes, what Smith meant was that taxes should be fairly distributed and predictable, not necessarily light, easy in that sense, but just, fair and predictable. And unlike most of Asia, the ordinary people in Japan, the peasants, the merchants, the traders, were left with a good deal of their wealth. It wasn't all creamed off. And again, this is related to islandhood and is similar to England. The absence of standing armies, which are very expensive and are necessary if you're a land continental civilization for fighting off outsiders. The absence of this and also of a large centralized bureaucracy which tends to go with large armies and continental countries meant that not too much was siphoned off in the way of taxation to the center. Again there was the odd social classes in China, the system is very simple in a way. There's the mandarins, the lit literati, and there are the peasants, a two-fold social structure. In the West, in Indo-European systems, there are four orders, the rulers, the chattriya, the, the nobles, the clergy, the townsmen, the bourgeois, and the peasants. Japan has the rulers, the peasants, but two other economic classes, merchants and traders. It's very odd to have these two separated. Nowhere else I know of has that. And it's also very odd that in terms of their standing, the peasants were above the merchants and the traders. So the highest status for peasants, agricultural workers, and there was no clergy, as in China, no order of clergy. Studies show that wealth differentials did not increase very much between 1600 and 1850. Everyone was getting slightly richer through those centuries. It was a peculiarly middle class, some would say lower middle class society, as it is today, with very little wealth differentiation. In terms of due administration of law, here Japan was very odd since to a, a large extent it didn't have any law at all. Criminal law was very harsh traditionally and civil law was almost absent. 
mutual surveillance and mutual responsibility. Uh, those were the key words, in which there was little crime and a great deal of trust. In other words, it was indeed a due administration of law, but by means which Smith could not have envisaged. There was also political cohesion. Power was very widely spread, but directed towards the center. Firstly, there was the shogunate system, which is uh, where the military ruler of the shogun lived in Tokyo, and had a way of enforcing his rule by bringing in the daimyo, the next level, for alternate years to live there as a kind of hostages for their good behavior. And later, it was integrated through the reinvented tradition of emperor worship. And then, after the Second World War, the powerful central bureaucracy. All this means that there was little contestation, uh, a, a great deal of upwards and inwards loyalty towards the center and uh, proper integration. In terms of education and skills, I've already mentioned the manual dexterity and the love of craft perfection which is very widespread in Japan. And Japan also had a, an amazingly literate population. In the Tokugawa period, a higher literacy rate was to be found in Japan than anywhere else in the world, as far as I know. There were good schools and a love of literature, which was widespread. And it continues to have a huge pressure on education, at least to the end of schooling. And finally, religion. Robert Bella, the American sociologist, argued that there is something about Japanese reformed Buddhism, especially Zen, which makes it a functional equivalent to Max Weber's Protestant ethic thesis. It's puritanical, hardworking, honest, time accounting, an inner drive towards achievement, a rejection of outward authorities. They are, as Weber might have put it, the Benjamin Franklins of the East. Possibly there's something in this, though it can be overdone. But even with all these factors, and I think all of them contribute and are essential, there's something else which escapes us these are perhaps some of the necessary preconditions for economic development, and they made Japan like a, a bonfire, which was just ready to be set alight by Western technology and spirit. But they're not sufficient in themselves, and they don't perhaps capture the whole story. So this is the puzzle I tried to portray in my book, Japan Through the Looking Glass. And I can only give a tiny part of the plot of the extraordinary answer which I found after working on Japan for 15 years or so with close friends. When I first went to Japan in 1990, I thought I was going to just another modern, indeed very modern, society. When I arrived in, uh, at Tokyo at the airport, and then in Hokkaido, Sapporo, it seemed to be confirmed that this was an ultra-rational, efficient, clean, modern, orderly, industrial society, nothing different really from what I'd left in the West, except cleaner. And uh, I sort of wondered why I'd gone on that way, just to replicate what I already knew. So I wasn't given a, a great shock, and for about 10 years or so, I tried to understand it using the conventional modernization theories in sociology from the West, looking at the factors which had led to modernity in the West, according to the great social theorists like Weber, and tried to apply those to Japan. I tried to fit Japan 
within the famous models from the Enlightenment thinkers such as Montesquieu and Adam Smith through to Mar Marx, Weber and Durkheim. But I was just hitting my head against a stone wall. All my attempts failed. Whenever I applied a, a Western binary distinction, for example, the famous one between community with a capital C and association with a capital A, as it's known, Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft, uh, according to Tony's, or between the individual and the group, or the material and the spiritual, or the numerous other binary oppositions, such as the opposition between games and religion, between nature and culture, between male and female, old and young. Whenever I applied these binary distinctions, something seemed to be lost. It seemed to fail as a way of understanding Japan. I continued, though, to set up benchmarks, as Weber had told us to do, scales upon which Japan could be measured, derived from my study of other world civilizations, with perhaps a simple integrated peasant society at one end, the sort of world I'd known in the Himalayas, and America at the other. And I tried to put Japan somewhere on this continuum or ruler. But it was not just that I find it very difficult to place it on the ruler, it sort of slipped and slid around. But in fact it didn't seem to work at all, it didn't fit on this scale at all. In every case, both now and in the past, Japan was famously both and. It wasn't one or the other. It was both contractual and status-based. Both this worldly, yet full of invisible spirit, kami. Both logical and irrational. Both innocent and pornographic, both peaceful and very aggressive and warlike. The list, which is the kind of thing one finds in the famous books on Japan, for example, even in the title, The Chrysanthemum and the Sword, by Ruth Benedict and the whole of Benedict's book, the list of contradictions is endless. But what most of those who end up in puzzlement do not explain is how it works. How did these both and characteristics come about? It's essential, of course, to avoid any what's known as Nihon Jinron, that is the peculiarity of Japan, imputations of a strong neo-nationalist kind arguing that the Japanese are unchanging, homogenous, imbued by some deep cultural speciality in their DNA, as it would now be called. Clearly, Japan changes all the time and has been changing. It's a world away from what it was a thousand years ago. It's clearly not at all homogenous. You just have to sit on an underground and look at the people. Clearly there are indeed many Japans with many different original influences that came from all over the place. It's a Mongol country, not homogenous and not unchanging. And clearly what happened is nothing to do with the innate DNA. DNA. What happened was an accident. Yet having said all this, it's still odd. For what I felt as I visited Japan now well over half a dozen times. I read about it in book after book, compared it with my experiences in other parts of Asia and in the West, was that I was in what the writer Borges would call a third world, a tertium orbis, or what that great Oxford writer Lewis Carroll would call the world of Alice, Alice through the looking glass or in Wonderland. I was in a world where there are impossible associations, where the logic 
I had been brought up in does not work. I felt I had stepped into a mirror where things are not just reversed as Alice found when she walked through the mirror. At first it was just a room that was reversed of her sitting room, but she went further. It was much more than that. All the connections were different, not just back to front, as in many of the famous uh, reactions to Japan of from Alcock to Isabella Bird, but where the arrangement is totally different from what I had expected or been trained to understand. For, and this was recognized from very early on, Western experienced Victorian travelers did not merely say that Japan was different from other places they had visited. They claimed that it was like visiting another planet. Isabella Bird, who was already widely traveled when she went to Japan, commented in 1880 that, quote, Japan offers as much novelty, perhaps, as an excursion to another planet, end of quote. Edwin Arnold, who had had a very long and distinguished career in India, wrote that he was in a new world, life in which is almost as strange and different as would be existent in the moon. A particularly elegant account of the feelings was given by W. E. Griffiths, who spent several years in Japan. Quote, a double pleasure rewards the pioneer who is the first to penetrate into the midst of a new people. Besides the rare exhilaration felt in treading soil virgin to alien feet, it acts like mental oxygen to look upon and breathe in a unique civilization like that of Japan. To feel that for ages, millions of one's own race and have lived and loved enjoyed and suffered and died, living the fullness of life, yet without the religion, laws, customs, food, dress and culture, which seems to be, to us, to be the vital vitals of our social existence. All this is like walking through a living Pompeii. End of quote. At the end of the 19th century, Lafcadio Hearn, who spent many years in Japan, married a Japanese lady and took Japanese citizenship, gives one of the most forceful accounts of the surprise he felt. He was able to observe a world as yet not totally overlaid by a veneer of modern industrial and urban development. He comments on both the strangeness and the sense that there is something enchanted about the country, a mysterious world of magical otherness which lay behind the surface of life. He describes quite how, quote, as first perceived, the outward strangeness of things in Japan produces in certain minds at least, a queer thrill impossible to describe, a feeling of weirdness which comes to us only with the perception of the totally unfamiliar." End of quote. This feeling grows rather than diminishes. Quote, Further acquaintance with this fantastic world will in no wise diminish the sense of strangeness evoked by the first vision of it. You will soon observe that even the physical actions of the people are unfamiliar, that their work is done in ways the opposite of Western ways. He concludes that, quote, these and other forms of unfamiliar action are strange enough to suggest the notion of a humanity, even physically, as little related to us as might be the population of another planet, the notion of some anatomical unlikeness. 
Again and again we have this metaphor of going to Mars, going to another planet, not just to another country. And although you can dismiss it and say it's just typical Nihon Jinron or uh, peculiar uniqueness the theories, I think there is something in it. And unless you accept the oddness, you'll never understand Japan. But what is it? And how did it come to be like that? It is a pure accident, and yet there is a history. Perhaps I can just mention one episode, the rest is explained in my book, but one episode which helped me to understand this roots, some of the roots of this peculiarity. One way of approaching the puzzling world of Japanese belief is to use the framework developed by the German philosopher Karl Jaspers. In his late work on the concept of the axial age, an, axial, an axis is something on which a wheel turns like this, so axial is of a great turning age. Jaspers drew attention to those civilizations which went through a great shift on the philosophical and religious axes. Almost all of them in the 500 years between about the 8th and the 2nd centuries before Christ. Before the Axial Age, the natural and the supernatural worlds were entangled with each other. They were not seen in contradiction or in opposition. As in most tribal religions, the world of spirit was largely a reflection of this world and intermingled with it. Humans and animals, this life and the afterlife were blended together. This is often a world of shamanism and witchcraft, of animism, that is to say that material things like rocks and trees and stones have a spirit in them, and of uh, attempts to force spirits through the use of sacrifice and magical spells to do what you want them to do. The divine world is not a separate ideal order against which we measure our lives, but just a continuation of the sensory world in an invisible, most of the time, order. For reasons which still have not really been explained, in much of Europe and Asia, over that period of 600 years, from about the 8th century BC, a simultaneously, and that's the strange thing, a, a number of great religious and philosophical figures emerged to change this. They created a dynamic tension, contradiction, between this world of physical matter and another world, invisible and up there, of spirit. They set up ideals against which our behavior should be measured and judged. New philosophical systems provided a reorganized relation between an absolute, a god as he was often called, or an ideal system, and this corrupted world which failed to live up to it. As Jaspers wrote, what is new about this age in all three areas of the world is that men, man becomes conscious of being, with a capital B, as a whole, of himself and his limitations. He experiences the terror of the world and his own powerlessness. He asks radical questions. Face to face with the void, he strives for liberation and redemption. By consciously recognizing his limits, he sets himself the highest goals. He experiences absoluteness in the depths of selfhood and in the lucidity of transcendence. Spiritual conflicts arose accompanied 
by attempts to convince others through the communication of thoughts, reasons and experiences. In this age, and I'm continuing the quotation from Jaspers, in this age were born the fundamental categories within which we still think today and the beginnings of the world religions by which humans still live were created. The step into universality was taken in every sense. End of quote. This is uh, taken from the first chapter of his great book, The Origins and Goal of History. Uh, that's the end of that quotation. In China, this happened in the work of Lao Tse and Confucius. In India, in the Upanishads and the teachings of the Buddha. In Iran, with Zarathustra or Zoroastra. In the Middle East, in the books of the great Old Testament prophets, including Elijah, Jeremiah and Isaiah. In Greece, in the fount of Western thought in Homer, Heraclitus, Plato and others. So China found its Confucian template by which it has lived ever since. Much of India and Central Asia, its Buddhist salvation. And the Western end of the continent, the firm foundations or the monotheistic religions of Judaism, Christianity and Islam, which were to dominate that world when combined with Greek philosophy. An aftershock of this great philosophical tsunami or tidal wave occurred about 2000 years later with the religious and scientific revolutions of the 16th and 17th centuries, as Jaspers explains. This took the oppositions and distinctions of the first separation between this world and another world to their ultimate conclusion. The radical dissociation of the natural and supernatural worlds, which was at the heart of Protestantism was combined with the separations which are associated with Descartes and the 17th century scientific revolution. This, what Weber calls disenchantment of the world, is the separation of the human world based on discoverable laws, natural laws about the world of physics and chemistry. A separation between that and the spiritual world, which is somewhere else. It is the end of the interfusing, the mixing of the natural and the supernatural, the end of a world suffused with miracles and magic. Having given this broad sweep picture from Jaspers, we may wonder where Japan fits in this grand story. My suspicion, as I argue in the book, is that Japan is the one great civilization that has not entered the axial age. Its geographically separated position and isolated religious history has meant that it has been protected against the religious tidal wave which swept over the rest of Europe and Asia. Evidence for this is to be found throughout the descriptions of Japanese attitudes to God, to heaven, hell, sin, nature and man. At the centre of it all is the absence of all dichotomies or oppositions of a radical kind. In Japan there is no radical split between the body and the soul. Quote, the Japanese never experience the splitting of the body and the soul that occurs in the consciousness of Western people. This is from Takio Doi. Or again, quote, to the Japanese, an individual life 
is an interrelationship of body, mind and spirit, the circle. This is from Matsumoto. Shinto, for example, quote, is a way of embracing reality characterized by non-duality. There has been no historical parallel for what Westerners call identity. Matsumoto again. Ruth Benedict wrote that just as alien in Japan is the doctrine that the flesh and the spirit are irreconcilable. The oppositions and contradictions created by the axial philosophers are absent. Quote, Intellect itself was considered subordinate to ethical emotion. Man and the universe were conceived to be alike, spiritual and ethical. That's from Nutobe. One of the most fundamental ideas of the nature of the world in Japan, Robert Smith tells us, is that there is no recognized separation of the moral order from the actual. Yet it is that very separation and dynamic tension between the ideal and the actual which is the heart of all the world religions. In Japan everything is interconnected, unseparated, relative and impermanent. Nothing is absolute, and there is no contradiction between the here and now and the eternal, between the ought and the is, between man and God. Jaspers himself seems to have assumed that Japan became influenced by and adapted to axiality. Yet, in his majestic work on Japanese civilization, the sociologist Eisenstadt has argued with a great deal of supporting evidence that Japan managed to subvert the axial philosophies as they came into the country, so that they lost their basic tension between the ideal and the actual. Eisenstadt writes that the distinctiveness of Japan lies in its being the only non-axial civilization that maintained throughout its history up to the modern time a history of its own without becoming in some way marginalized by the axial civilizations China and Korea Confucianism and Buddhism with, with, with which it was in continuous contact. End of quote. Eisenstadt argues that, quote, from such a comparative point of view, the most important feature of the Japanese historical experience is that it is the only non-axial civilization to have had a continuous autonomous and very turbulent history up to and including modern times. What happened, that's the end of the quote, what happened was that Japan somehow resisted the central thrust of the great transformation which had spread all over Europe and Asia during the thousand years before the birth of Christ as the anthropologist Maraini also notes of the Japanese, quote, over the centuries they have resisted first the huge cultural pressures of China and Buddhism, and then that of Europe and the West, and have maintained intact their own primary original form of worship, linking them with nature and the gods, end of quote. What is particularly startling is that this should have been possible in one of the great literate 
world civilizations, which on the surface embraced the great traditions of Confucianism and Buddhism. Yet this is, as Eisenstadt argues, the case. So he writes that, quote, the transformation of Confucianism and Buddhism and later of Western ideologies in Japan constitutes the de-axialization of axial religions, ideologies and civilizations, not in the local or peripheral arenas of small traditions hanging on, but in the very core of the great tradition. And look at. Yet somehow the Japanese did this without shutting themselves off. Quote, the specific aspect of such domestication in the Japanese case has been the strong and rather paradoxical tendency to deaxialize Asian influences on a society wide level, combined with a continuous openness to outside influences and the development of highly sophisticated discourse, a combination not found in any other great civilization. In other words, Japan is not some local, oral, tribal, peripheral society which somehow maintained its pre-axial integration. It incorporated the great traditions of Confucianism, Buddhism, and later Western philosophies, but somehow turned them on their heads and stripped them of their central feature. It rejected the philosophical idea of another separate world of the ideal and the good, a world of spirit separate from man and nature against which we judge our actions and direct our attempts at salvation. It is an extraordinary situation and one which explains a great deal about the strangeness of Japan. It suggests that the whole underpinning of Japanese philosophy and cosmology is based on a radically different set of premises to the axial systems of mainland Europe and Asia, including China. That this has been difficult to see until time elapsed is shown by the experiences one of the most sophisticated students of Japanese religion from outside. When Robert Bella lectured in Japan in 1961, he believed that Japan was still in the archaic or prehistoric stage of religion until the later 19th century. Yet, quote, however different their modern experiences have been, the last hundred years have shattered, probably forever, their integrated cosmological symbolic structures, though elements of those structures survive in many new forms. The traditional symbolic structures have not, as integrated entities, been able to withstand the massive invasion of Western cultural forms. Everywhere, the new Western ideologies touch the traditional East Asian symbolizations. They corrode and eventually destroy them. This was how he felt at that time. His evidence, he admitted, was patchy and thin, consisting of a few quotations from Japanese Christians and the likely effect of Marxism. The evidence since he lectured suggests that Bella's guesses about what would happen are wrong, as Eisenstadt has powerfully argued. So 
how does this did this all happen? How did this strange rejection of axiality maintain itself? This is a complex story, and I tell it a little more length in the book. Basically, being an island with a rough sea of over a hundred miles from Korea and twice that from China, Japan managed to filter out all binary and axial opposition, oppositions as they drifted in to Japan. It learnt over nearly 2,000 years how to retain at the level of culture and society a largely undivided world. It filtered out the great waves of Chinese influence, reversing Confucianism, turning Buddhism into a this-worldly and de-axialized religion. Having done this over the period 600 to 1500, when faced with the next great onslaught of axiality, namely Christianity and Western individualism, by way of the Portuguese and Dutch in the 16th and 17th centuries, and then later the post-Meiji onslaught of the West in the later 19th century, Japan did the same thing. It performed what Fukuzawa and others suggested was a famous mixture of Western technology and Eastern spirit. This is what I think gives it its extraordinary feel when I am in Japan, I feel I am in two worlds simultaneously. And when I talk to people, they give me contradictory answers. For instance, I am constantly told that there is no religion in Japan, and nobody knows what religion is, there's no word for it, and we don't have it. Yet, the place is knee-deep, at least some of the older parts, in shrines, temples, household gods, and purifying rituals. Likewise, its economy seems to be on two levels. The world of things, goods, production is highly efficient and market-oriented, while the world of people, labor relations, and commitment to work is to a considerable extent based on non-market non principles. Let me conclude. I take as my central authorities in many ways Fukuzawa Yukichi, about whom I've written a book, and Maruyama Masao, the two great, greatest thinkers in terms of social and political thought in the 19th and 20th centuries in Japan. Their ideas have deeply influenced me. What they showed was the deep contradictions which have remained in Jap Japanese civilization. It's not become Western at its core, though on its surface it's very modern. Mariyama, for example, in his later work, emphasized the deep continuities of Japanese history and proclaimed that Japan had never become modern. What I think he means is by this is modern in the Western sense. When I try to explain to my students the essence of modernity, I suggest that it, it is the 500 years of effort in the West to separate the four great spheres of human life, power, politics, belief, religion, production, economics, and society, the family and social life. Capitalism basically consists of the separation of society and economy. Modern science and democracy of the separation of politics and religion. But in terms of these separations, Japan has no such separations, at least not along these lines. 
This is why it feels both pre- and postmodern at the same time. It is in many ways a thought experiment of the impossible from the Western point of view, as Alice might have said. It is a good country to think with. The only apparent alternatives to the open and modern world are the various fundamentalisms which rejoin together the separated spheres of modernity. Confucianism, sorry, communism, communism and fascism are examples of this which tried to fuse together things again but failed and are currently dead. Some forms of Islam tries to do so. Some forms of fundamentalism, uh, Christianity likewise. Japan is the only real alternative to Western individualistic capitalism where a major civilization is both highly successful yet not Western. As such, even if they are not enthused by some of the side effects, the terrible effects of Japanese imperialism in the middle of the 20th century, for example, people in Asia should be encouraged to find that it is possible to be, to a certain extent, and indeed a considerable extent, both efficient and lead a meaningful and undivided life on principles which are not just giving in to Western individualism. The Western route, in other words, is not the only one. There are alternatives lying behind the Japanese looking glass, but they require a considerable effort on our part to see them, to travel in that strange 